Hello everyone and welcome to my response to Sargon's recent video detailing the political philosophy of Starship Troopers, and by extension Robert Heinlein. This video is not a critique of Sargon's interpretation of Heinlein society, but a critique of its applicability in a modern setting, and in the world we live in today. If you haven't seen his video already, there's a link in the description, it's very well produced, it's a very thoughtful passion project for Sargon's, and it's well worth your time. This video aims to reveal the flaws in Sargon's view that this is a system we should emulate uh, or create. It will act as if the UK is the first nation to attempt to implement this system. Let's get straight to my first point, the birth of the system. In Highline's fictional world, the government has been usurped by a military coup, which goes on to instill the values of service equal citizenship and a small, hyper-efficient government which manages said system. One of the core tenets of this system is the idea of selective suffrage and unlimited citizenship offered to all at the cost of service. The service that is given doesn't matter particularly, but has to be hard-earned and suffered for in some way, shape or form. In today's world, universal suffrage based democracy forms the core of the voting system, and the only systems that have previously existed that denied suffrage to some citizens have been either feudal, fascist or communist in design, all of which have had demonstrably bad outcomes until they were succeeded by existing systems of democratic capitalist rule. To be blunt, there is no platform on which a political party today can operate offering people the chance to vote to remove their right to vote, which will succeed, not only because people not well versed in Heinlein's philosophy will instantly interpret this as a violation of their freedom to influence the government, but because the other competing parties will also demonise this decision as a restrictive and authoritarian policy, and it is restrictive. The everyman will not get behind the idea of reducing their own influence. Similarly, if a military intervention was to come about, the universally democratic allies of the UK would step in to prevent the usurpation of the nation, particularly in the West where a fear of returning to the far right and fascist tendency dominates attacks from political entities upon one another, this would trigger a response from not only the USA, but NATO allies and certainly the European Union nations as well. In short, the only way that this system would come into being is a worldwide, or at least west-wide revolution either of thought or of violence. As attempts at communism have proven, universal thought is a fairy tale, and violence begets more violence, which would be taken advantage of by other competing nations. But let's say for the sake of argument that this system comes into power by whatever means. The first thing it has to do is convince the rest of the world that it is not fascist, by demonstrating that it has an unbiased and diverse voter base from whom it draws legitimacy. Who does it make citizens first? Veterans? The military? Public services? The struggle and the cost of service to the nation or state is a finicky concept to pin down. Hard earned service is a broad and subjective issue. How can you measure it? If we were to only take veterans and military personnel at first, the military contains a scope of positions, some physically demanding, others less so. The personnel support officer works in an office for the length of their service, and certainly does not undergo the same physical hardship as an infantryman. The technical mental requirements of an engineer, conversely, are more demanding than that of the infantry. Let's not even get into the fact that for many military careers it takes varying amounts of time to train such individuals, given that Heinlein proposes a two-year service, or that transfer from trade to trade or branch to branch is a regular occurrence. It is thus more than a little difficult to pin down what is acceptable service in the context that citizenship must be earned, even in the microcosm of the military. This leads on to the ethics of such a program. Someone with a physical disability that renders them unfit for regular service would have to be assessed by a state official, presumably, or an independent contractor, in order to ascertain what the bounds of their service would entail. As suffering or hardship is a key component of the pursuit of citizenship, what assessment could even decide what is plausible here? Even then, how can it be moral to force someone to perform a task that could exacerbate their symptoms or cause lasting damage? The cost is surely in the graft and grit of the individual proving they have the will to become a citizen, rather than incurring a physical cost, a mental cost, and for the nation potentially an increased medical cost for such hardship. Heinlein's fiction takes place in a world where medical technology far outstrips today's. In a sense, the physical suffering of citizenship candidates is alleviated in the knowledge that should they become infirm, short of losing a limb, they can be healed rapidly and their suffering only inconveniences them in the short term. This is clearly not applicable today. 
Again, let us assume a suitable range of tasks is found to qualify for citizenry. We then have the consideration of job provision. Where do these range of tasks come from, and what do we do in the event of a surplus or shortage of volunteers? The state would have to expand or shrink reflexively year on year based on the number of willing participants. This is problematic for a number of reasons, but chiefly in terms of consistency. The industries which would be populated by volunteers would never be stable in numbers, and the only way you could ensure that you always had a place for a volunteer would be to have a state-managed economy, which is the polar opposite of the goal of the system. Finally, let's talk about corruption. Heinlein's fantasy has a corruptionless small government. Politicians and hierarchies are robust enough to resist such things due to the emphasis on national or in Heinlein's case, global identity. There is a uniformity of purpose and ideology when it comes to the management of state resources and in the punishments for failure in the management of those resources. In reality, we are a collection of disparate groups, each individual within each with their own set of principles and morals. Social networking is a key component of the human experience, and those with similar goals often align in similar jobs. We already see cronyism within government and in public services services, particularly at the top, where friends and colleagues protect one another and cover failings. Despite transparency and accountability being laudable goals, humankind is not perfect, and people in comfortable or powerful positions will fight hard to keep them, even if that means deception. I do not see how a one-party system, as is effectively proposed by Heinlein, given the uniformity of opinion on the principles of society, as Sargon outlined them, can survive inevitably becoming corrupt, as those who fail but hide their accountability survive those who give up their positions in good faith. I hope this has outlined the basics of why I believe Sargon's view of aspiring to Heinlein's liberal utopia is not a viable candidate for a system of government in the real world. There are further reasons that compound the issues above, including voting blocks, voter fraud, and non-citizen advocacy groups that I could get into, but I think that they only serve to reinforce the points I've made above, rather than add anything new. This isn't meant to be a long rant at Sargon, just some food for thought and some reasoned arguments. Thank you all for watching and have a great week.